just uh, a little uh, housekeeping issues. Uh, please uh, turn your cell phones off if you don't mind. And uh, there are evaluations to be completed. It's, it's helpful, really, if you take the time to do that. Also, for the DP and PC fellows, there are uh, post and pre-test to be completed as well that will help everyone to get the appropriate credits. I will pass now the microphone to Dr. Peter Holman. Okay. So let, me re let me re mic myself. Okay. Um, so as an intro, let me see how clumsy I am. Um, Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, my background, um, basically, um, believe it or not, my background is mostly in psychology. So I have an MA, a uh, BA, an MA, a PhD in psychology. The, uh, the PhD is in experimental cognitive psychology. And um, basically, uh, my dissertation was on semantic memory and bilinguals. And um, after finishing my dissertation, I swore I wouldn't go into uh, at least academic psychology, mostly because um, uh, I got tired of, um, you know, I, I didn't see my life um, uh, measuring reaction times in people, uh, asking them, okay, is, is a bird, uh, is, is a robin a bird, or is it a vegetable? So I decided to go into something a little bit more lucrative and uh, a little bit more interesting, uh, like statistics. So I got a degree in biostatistics, and so after... Um, Several jobs I, I've, I've wound up uh, working for a very nice department, the Department of Pain Medicine and Palliative Care. And guess what? Half of my, my time is spent doing psychology. But at least it's in a, um, the nice thing about it is that it's um, um, doing things that I think consider important for furthering science and furthering uh, um, humanity. So, um, you know, at least I'm not measuring reaction times anymore. So. <laughs> Anyway, so today we're going to be talking about testing and measurement, and um, um, I'm going to be main mentioning actually one of the projects I've worked on, and why, and that's somehow for some reason palliative care didn't come out, but anyway, that's what it is. So Department of Pain Management and Palliative Care. So, um, so we're going to be talking about basically everything from the very ground from the from the ground up. So you know. How do we develop items for, um, to, to use in, a, in a, an instrument or a questionnaire? Then we're talking about things like actually testing those items and doing item selection, item reduction, fascinating topics like factor analysis and Cronbach's alpha, um, reliability, and then um, kind of um, um, things a little bit more interesting. Um, how do you determine the validity of your uh, instrument? So um, actually, we're going to be concentrating mostly on construct validity, but I'll have to mention some of these other things because everyone else does. Um, let's see. So psychometrics. Remember psychology? Um, so psychometrics is the measurement of um, psychological concepts. And so um, you d basically, you want to measure psychological concepts for three basic reasons. First of all, for assessment. So, um, for example, if you want to determine someone's eligibility for going into college, you want to give them a test uh, beforehand to see whether or not um, their possible grade point average is going to be high enough to make it worthwhile to admit them into college. Uh, diagnosis or screening, so things like uh, the Beck Depression Scale um, uh, are used for determining whether or not someone's um, <coughs> either um, in a state that uh, requires medical uh, uh, treatment or may, may actually um, uh, simply need referral uh, because there's a possibility of, of um, uh, developing depression. And then finally, um, research. So um, research studies require that you compare different groups, different individuals, correlate them. And so you need measurements of, of psychological concepts to see, for example, whether or not that has anything to do with the success of, of some medical treatment. Um, constructs, <clears throat> or psychological constructs. Um, basically, when we deal with something psychological, um, everyone knows what you're talking about, but when you start talk, we're actually discussing it, it kind of becomes, what really is it? So something like IQ. Uh, anyone want to tell me a definition of what IQ is? Anyone? What's I, what's, or what's intelligence? L let me make it more basic. What's, what's intelligence? Okay. Well, it's a little bit different. There are, there are 
those are, you know, there are achievement tests or aptitude tests. So those are different from intelligence tests. So basically, in, in, intelligence tests, uh, I mean, the, the basic definition I've heard is that it's the ability to learn and to use what you've learned. Okay? And so it's distinct from aptitude or achievement because that uh, intelligence is supposed to be, allow you to you know, be apt at solving problems or to, allows you to achieve or learn things. So, um, you know, so you, re you realize that when you start discussing these things, it's, the definitions aren't clear, even though people use these terms every day. And it's like, you know, um, you know it's like in the common language, I mean, people don't, you know, don't take these things for, um, I mean, they don't really consider these things until, like, you know, someone says, well, what is it? You know? So things like psychological concepts that are constructs that people deal with all the time are things like cognition, intelligence, aptitude, morality, mental health, whatever that is, spirituality, empathy, quality of life, caregiver burden. So we're going to be talking about caregiver burden a lot because that's one of the, uh, one of the areas I work in. Um, let's see, do we need to, why do we develop and measure? Well, one reason is that we suddenly encountered some construct or some, if some, some psychological notion or construct that no one's measured before, so we have to come up with an entirely new measure. More often than not, you know, um, the wheel's already been invented, so um, um, there probably is already a measure. You know, if you go through PubMed or one of those things and bring up intelligence, you know, you're going to come up like a couple of thousand different entries at, at the very least. Um, so more often, the reason why you come up with a measure nowadays is to come up with a a more accurate or a more precise measure of some construct, something that's easier or, or, or uh, shorter to administer. So instead of administering a 100-item depression scale, maybe you have one that's, that only has 20 items. It's faster to administer. It's easier for, on the patient and might even be just as accurate as the 100-item one. And again, um, it, maybe it's better for accounting for con some construct because a construct can be pretty complicated and has, can have many parts, and so it could be that some previous, uh, previously existing um, instrument doesn't account for all the things you think should go into measuring that construct. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to be talking about something called the BASC, or the Brief Assessment Scale for Caregivers, um, and um, this is something that was published in 2005, and um, it was something I was helpful in, in kind of bringing uh, in, into the world. And um, I, at the very least, I came up with the, the acronym. Um, so, um, okay. Why did we need, need a new caregiver measure? Well, um, the Department of, of Pain Medicine and Palliative Care, um, by its nature, deals not only with patients, but also with caregivers of, of, of those patients, especially with, care, uh, with uh, caregivers dealing with chronically ill or dying patients. And we had looked at pre-existing measures, and we found that most of them concentrated on negative aspects of caregiving. It's, it's, a, it's a chore, it's work, it's pain, you know, it's depressing, that kind of thing. And um, there were some that asked about positive aspects of caregiving, but um, most of these were really long. They were kind of more, um, more useful for doing, for research, where you have a captive audience, maybe like, you know, undergraduates. Um, but, you know, it, to be used in a clinical situation, they were just um, too long to be practical. And so what we needed was um, a brief measure, first of all, that dealt with the positive and negative aspects of caregiving. And so what we needed to do... Yeah, okay. What we needed to do is, first of all, come up with uh, items. You know, we have to come up with the questions to ask, first of all. And so um, what you need to do, first of all, whenever you, you know, whether or not there's a pre-existing measure or whatever, you have to, first of all, do your research. And uh, you have to come up with, um, you, you have to consider the construct and in all its aspects, all its different parts. And then you have to ha come up with nice, brief questions that, um, deal with all of those, uh, all of those different subparts of those constructs. And so, um, and a number of items in, uh, can depend, can depend on, on the complexity of the construct. Um, so to do this, you do literature review. You see what's been done before. You, you even go into, you know, um, there are plot, uh, you, you can kind of get inspiration from um, philosophies, social medicine, uh, so you don't have to restrict yourself to the medical research. Um, 
Another approach is to get expert panels. So you have people who've done research in that area, and you get them together either singly or together in a group, and you ask them questions. You know, here's a construct, um, caregiver burden. Tell me everything you think that goes into that, that from your experience dealing with caregivers. That's one approach. Another approach that's used widely is the focus group. And so you get, you know, the real experts. The experts, you know, you get caregivers themselves, for example, and you, you ask them, you know, it, you know, in a group, um, like, what is it to, you know, what, what are all the things that you encounter as a caregiver? What are all, you know, what are all the negative parts? What are all the positive parts? So, um, um, usually in a, caregiver, in a focus group, you get, you know, these are all kind of rules of thumb. Uh, how many people do you get? You get enough to kind of uh, have a group that's, that's going to um, start a discussion and continue a discussion. So one person might be a bit difficult. 20 people might be difficult. So you get some nice number, usually four, five to 10 people, who can um, start up a discussion and they'll go back and forth. And so basically, you know, you, you play it by ear. Then there's, a tr well, there's something called the trained, there's the facilitator who's trained to lead the focus group. So it's like, um, you need to uh, ride herd often on a focus group because otherwise they can get out of hand, they can get off topic, you know, they'll go off on tangents. Um, you know, but basically you have a main opening question um, and then you know, you, you see, you, the facilitator will see how that goes. You may ask probe questions. Well, you know, does it really work that way? Or you know, is there anything else you can think of? So basically it requires um, a kind of sensitivity to how um, the focus group is operating, how, you know, where the discussion is going to kind of get people to focus in, that's, that's what it's called, it's a focus group, to get them to talk about the thing that you're interested in. And to kind of, if there's a, a lull, then you kind of like liven things up by asking another question or, you know, just um, you know, asking people who haven't, who've been quiet to kind of maybe, you know, can you think of something? So, um, it's, you know, the, the facilitator plays a very important part in leading the focus group. Then you, re, re, then you record the dialogue and then you transcribe everything to a written version. And um, let's see, let's go to, the, for the Basque focus groups we had um, three focus groups made up of family caregivers and one group of healthcare professionals. And so um, for the healthcare um, providers, uh, there are 10 people in each group, more or less, you know, give or, give or take a, uh, one or two. And there were, these were, we wanted to get a, a wide background. We didn't want to have just, say, cancer patients or patients of a certain type. So we actually went to agencies. And so we had caregivers of patients who were, um, some patients had ALS, um, some, people, some patients had sickle cell, and some patients had cancer. So a wide variety of chronic illnesses, wide variety of problems that caregivers could encounter dealing with these patients. And then the professional group were made up of medical and social uh, service providers, so social workers, psychologists. Um, I'm not sure if we had any clergy people, but um, basically they, they all had experience dealing with caregiver, caregivers and caregiver problems. Mm -mm. Okay. Content analysis. <clears throat> this is an area that I sometimes um, dip my toe into, but qualitative analysis basically means that you, you read through a transcript and you try to come up with what are the th basic themes that people are talking about and then what are like sub themes like the sub parts of that and then um, you know you, you also incorporate things like how people are feeling and you know like so like you'll make little notes um, uh, about how strongly people feel about these things and then um, and so this is something that also uh, requires training, so um, I mean, I've done it myself. I've, I've had to kind of do some practice on it. There's some software that, that, that helps you do this, but there's nothing um, that eliminates the need for some sort of training or background in doing qualitative analysis. Um, and so, it's the, um, so I don't know if I have to, you know. So anyway, um, it's something that you shouldn't do on your own, um, or don't do, it your, uh, do, don't do it at home, folks. Um, for the Basque content analysis, um, we had two of the investigators um, uh, went through the transcript and they basically categorized the, the comments made by the participants again into major themes. And then these got turned into questions. 
then we, we showed uh, a panel of 15 professionals some of these questions, and they provided uh, some additional questions and input. Um, so, um, and finally, we came up with 45 items, 45 questions that covered a wide variety of feelings and experiences of being a caregiver. So, there were 35 questions that dealt with negative experiences. So, these are things like, I feel distress at having strained relationships with other family members over taking care of my relative or friend. This is kind of a long one, so sorry. Um, and most of them were briefer than this. Then there, we wanted to make sure we tapped into the positive feelings. So one of, the, one of the things we got was like, taking care of my relative has drawn other members of our, of our family closer together. Okay? So, um, so we had, you know, it wasn't an equal split between negative and positive, but at least we, we, we tried tapping into the positive aspects of caregiving. <clears throat> Um, scaling. Okay. Um, I have no magic formula or, or solution to this. Um, you know, in general, you get everything from yes, no questions in, in, in instruments. And so, like, the MMPI um, is, is a fun test to take. Um, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory is supposed to tell you whether, um, I mean, it's used a lot in, in, um, in occupational testing and, you know, it screens for people with major. Um, psychological problems, um, and that uses a yes-no format. The problem with yes-no formats is that um, the, usually the, the more variance, the more variability in your response, the better, um, the easier it is to correlate your, those responses with other responses. So um, the advice is try to stay away from yes-no questions unless you have like a whole, um, a whole battery of like several hundred items, which is what you have in the NMPI. Um, Likert rating scales. Now, um, Rensis um, um, actually pronounces, pronounces his name Likert, but I'll, I'll stick with Likert. So anyway, Likert rating scales are numeric scales, and um, they can have any. They can be either odd or even number of, of rating items, and they can, you know, so you can have three, four, five, seven, eleven is like the classic one that uh, Jaco uses for pain, and it's used for uh, for the brief pain inventory, for example. Um, there are discussions about whether you want odd versus even units, depending, and the, the, the choice there is whether or not, um, if you have an odd item, a lot of people like to stick to the middle, and so if you have an odd number of items, people will tend to, stick, to pick the middle one a lot of times. Um, so if you want to make sure that people make, are definite either one side or the other, then you choose an even number because they've got to choose. Okay? Um, but that's kind of like... Uh, most of the time, I've seen odd number uh, uh, numbers of um, uh, ratings, and um, let's see. We used a four-point scale, which um, uh, is, I think was used in a previous uh, instrument that we liked, so we decided to use that as well. There's the visual analog scale, or the VIS, <clears throat> which is basically either a line that's like 10 centimeters or 100 millimeters wide, or it's a box that's 10 centimeters or 100 millimeters wide, and you ask a question. Um, how bad was your pain, or how bad was your how was how bad was your experience as a caregiver? And usually, and what you tell people is that if you choose something at the left side of the box, it means little or or no problems. Or and if you choose something at the top of the box or the line, you know it's like as bad as you can imagine. Um, and so anywhere in between is something that is you know either moderate or 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 or, or, or but basically it's a way of Doing away with numbers, it's supposed to be more intuitive. And also it gives all people opportunity, the ones who like to choose, like, oh, I can't make up my mind between three and four, let's make it 3.5, you know. So it, it's, it gives people a little bit more freedom. And um, um, basically, what, to score it, you have to take a ruler and you have to kind of measure it. Um, there, there probably are computerized ways of measuring it. Um, Actually, a lot of people don't find it that intuitive. That's been my experience. And actually, a lot of studies feel, find that people, even children, prefer the numeric scales over the, over the VIS. Yeah. Peter, if, if you have a numeric scale and you, let's say you send them to patients, patients send it back, mm -hmm. and they mark between numbers yeah. rather than one or the other, what do you do with the situation? Um, Can you I, I've, I've, yeah, I've, I've sometimes used like the average of the two or depending on whether or not I, I, I want to be a little bit more conservative, I might choose one over the other. So it's really more a matter of um, uh, discretion choice. So, you know, if, um, but a lot of times I've just used, you know, like if it's between three and four, I'll use 3.5, you know. You know, if they go into like, you know, it's like 
you know, you, you want to take the ruler and actually measure it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you, you can, but um, usually it doesn't make that much of a difference, uh, like half a point. But okay. So anyway, um, so I, I think for the most part you're going to find Likert scales used in, in uh, most instruments. <clears throat> um, <coughs> test sample. Again, no magic formula here. Um, basically, you need um, uh, a sample of appropriate people who are going to fill out your, your, your questionnaire. So um, getting a sample is almost like having a clinical trial. You have inclusion and exclusion criteria. You want to have people who have, with a certain amount of experience, for example, as caregivers. So you, um, you don't want people who are like the, you know, the cousins second removed who've seen this, this family member like every two years or something like that. You want to have, so you, you want to have people who've had like a regular um, uh, experience do, as a caregiver, for example. And you want, pe want people who are, you know, have other criteria. So the patient may have to be chronically ill for a certain amount of time, et cetera. So basically, you know, you, you, you choose the, the sample according to... Um, the, the, um, to criteria that will enable you to get a wide variety and, and you know, um, some degree of expertness with regard to opinion. Um, sample size, there's no magic formula here, as many as you can get. As, and usually, you know, 100 seems to be like the minimum. That's kind of, it's like, if you have less than 100, you know, it may not get published, so it's that kind of thing. So uh, we, we, we used 100 for uh, our study. Um, and Basically, a sample of 100 gives you 80% power to detect a, what would be considered a, a, a medium effect size, according to uh, Jack Cohen. So it, it, uh, you, you'd be able to, to detect a correlation down to a 0.29. So usually correlations less than that are pretty small, and so like, they're, they're not really, they may not be clinically interesting or, or, or clinically significant. So um, that seems to be a kind of safe number. I mean, uh, if you have a lot of money, and um, you might want to choose like a couple hundred, but you know. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. the correlation between what and what, what oh, research? well, you know, if you do a power analysis and you, you, you just look at what, what kind of correlation can you detect with a sample of a hundred, you can go down to a, a correlation, you know, any correlation, I mean, or you know, like any comparison with a hundred people will allow you to detect uh, will detect a correlation of 0.29 with 80 percent chance. Of, uh, of getting so what significant. What would be an example of comparison? Well, like between, say, uh, our scale, the Basque, and, say, age of the caregiver. Well, just a simple correlation. But I, I just wanted to show, illustrate, um, you know, a very simple way. What, what could you do with a sample of 100? So I'm not going to go into multiple regression and things like that. So, so or, or controlling of, for number of comparisons. Yeah. Most of, of, of the studies using these tools, mm -hmm. they use a minimum of 100. Everybody it the same number. Yeah, it seems to be like a magic number. You know? so, and so there's nothing, you know, um, I, I, I just threw in the power analysis to kind of give it some sort of sanctity. Okay. All right. So um, we also had other instruments that we wanted to correlate with uh, our uh, instrument once we had developed it. And so... Um, these are things like there was a there's a very widely used background scale called a Calb Calb G or actually Calg B, um, which and we added a couple of things like um, some characteristics of the caregiver. Then there was another um, another measure of caregiver burden that we threw in. Um, let's see, uh, caregiver physical health. Uh, so just what kind of diagnosis did the caregiver have? We wanted to throw in spiritual well-being. Being it was something of interest to one of the. Um, the uh, the investigators. Do you have a question, Ricardo? No, no, no. Okay. Um, we had a measure of social support, um, a one-item Likert scale um, uh, of satisfaction with the patient's medical care, uh, a measure of unmet needs on, uh, for the patient, me a mental health uh, index consisting of five questions that came from the uh, something called the SF36, and then there was a um, 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 there was a, a multi part um, uh, instrument measuring impact on quality of life. Uh, we'll get into these in more detail later on. Um, okay, so I've kind of quickly, um, bas basically we, we administered the item to these 100 patients. We did them pretty much individually or either, you know, individually or in, in groups of like five or 10 at a time. Uh, so it took us a while to come up with our, our sample of, of 100 uh, caregivers. 
Um, once we had all their responses, we entered their data into a computer file. We did something called factor analysis, and I promised myself I wouldn't get into any mathematics here or any real statistics. But anyway, um, a basic definition for factor analysis is that it's a, it's a statistical technique for organizing items based on the, how they correlate with one another. And so basically, it, uh, you can judge how closely related they are to one another based uh, by looking at their correlations, and you can actually kind of group them together. And most of the time, what they sh what they should show is that you know things that deal with um, um, the negative aspects of caregiving, load on one scale or on one factor. Things that deal with conflicts with with other family members uh, will load on another factor. Um, que questions that deal with the positive aspects of caregiving will load on another factor. So you'll get multiple factors, and, and you'll find that the questions will load on. Um, should organize themselves according to how closely related they are, and that's ultimately determined by how they correlate with one another. Um, and so you'll also find that some items that don't relate to anything else will uh, won't will only load on to say one factor. So it's like a one factor item, and usually those are the kinds of things that you can get rid of. And so that that goes into um, what's called item reduction. Um, once you identify all these different factors. Um, you got to look at what's called internal consistency. And again, without being too mathematical, um, internal consistency is usually measured by something called Cronbach's alpha. And um, what it really is, is it, it, it's, it measures, as it says, internal consistency, the way things hang together. So basically, it's just an overall measure of how they're correlated with one another. And so it's kind of related to, to factor analysis, but a factor analysis organizes them together. In the uh, Cronbach's alpha tells you how strongly are they related to one another. Um, and so basically internal consistency is used as a way of, it's a, it's a cheap and dirty way of getting reliability because if, if items, in order for items to correlate with themselves at a later time, which is what's called test-retest reliability, or correlate with other, another instrument, they've got to, they've got to correlate with themselves. And so internal consistency is considered a lower bound for any kind of other reliability measure. So if you have like 0.6 is your, um, is your Cronbach's alpha, you, and you, you interpret it like a correlation coefficient, 0.6 con is considered like the lower bound to your reliability. So if you actually did a test retest reliability measure, so you measured, you, you administered your, your instrument at time one, and then six months later at time two, that test we test reliability should be higher. Okay, so at least you have with internal consistency or Cronbach's alpha, you have some way of determining um, uh, reliability, and it's usually easier to administer and cheaper to administer than act than doing a test we test reliability uh, situation. Um, usually, 0.6 is considered uh, the minimally acceptable alpha uh, coefficient. And if you get 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, then you get more brownie points for that. that you know, basically, it's more reliable, and it's, it's more trustworthy as an instrument. Um, and so subscales with poor alphas can also be dropped. Okay. Now, our first factor analysis was uh, pretty much abysmal. Um, <clears throat> so in the initial factor analysis of the 45 caregiver items resulted in 12 factors. And a lot of these factors had only one item loading on them, and others had low reliability. And in general, there was just an indication there was a lack of coherence. And when I, when I looked at the items, I kind of suspected a lot of them were redundant, or they, they, were, they were just like, they, they were just either redundant, so there are a lot, a lot of questions asking the same question, or others just were like totally all by themselves. And so I asked the investigators, do you think you can kind of go through these and just narrow down the items to what you think are the most important items? So they came back to me with 28 items. Uh, I'm sorry, they, they eliminated 28 items, which is kind of considerable, meaning there was a lot of fat there. Um, and then 17 items were left that they considered ca uh, captured the original domains of the focus groups, and, um, and so we were rid of um, a lot of redundancy. Okay, so these are the reduced items, and so what we had was... Um, um, Okay, I think I left out some things here. Um, basically, our aim was to get as few items as possible. We wanted to get, uh, if we had factors, we wanted to have 0.6 as the minimum of alpha on those factors. And um, 
Let's see. We are, and basically, uh, we wanted to have something where a higher score was indicative of greater caregiver burden. Um, let's see. Let's go to the next one. Okay. So. Oh, uh, just how um, you can actually look at how the items correlate to the to the factor, and so the, those are called factor loadings. So if you look in the in the output of the factor analysis, you'll see that there are like um, like four factors, and you can see that. Um, some items will correlate like 0 0.5, 0 0.6 with, the, with a factor, and others will be like close to zero, like 0 0.2, 0 0.1. Those are factor loadings, okay? Um, okay, so I kind of like got through that. Um, I didn't decide not to go through into a lot of detail about the factor analysis. Basically, in the end, we came up with five factors, and these were things like negative personal impact, uh, positive imp uh, personal impact, dealing with other family members, dealing with medical issues, you know, things like um, distress about making decisions about hospitalizing your, your relative or friend, um, and then concern about the loved one, just like, you know, how do you feel if you're away from the loved one? Are you worried for that loved one? Are you, you, know, are you sad? Um, and so um, one factor actually loaded onto two, uh, one item loaded onto two factors, which is kind of interesting. So that's how we come up with if you count up the number of items I have listed here, it's 15, and that's the explanation for that. Okay. Um, so, and let's see, let's go back. And in general, they were all, um, you know, 0.6 or above, except for concern for loved one. And, that, uh, and we decided that it was close enough to 0.6, we'd let it go. It only had two items. Uh, you know, it, it looked like it... Use your discretion sometimes. It looked like something that we wanted to measure. It was something that was an important aspect of, of caregiving. So we decided to leave it even though it had that, the, that low um, um, alpha coefficient. And what, what, what we typically warn people is that um, not to use it by itself. It should only be used together with all the other items with, with the total score. Okay. Um, okay. So the question is, what is a factor loading versus what is a uh, item total correlation? So, like, let's deal with the item total correlation. If you take the total score, so if you you have 14 items, you add up all the um, the scores for each person, then you correlate that with each of the individual items. Um, that gives you some um, some idea of how well each item contributes to the total score. And, and typically, um, th those, should be, um, those should be above zero. All right? A factor loading actually breaks down, um, this, the, um, breaks down things into factors. And so basically, you're, you're, it's kind of similar. You can take a look at, at how each individual item contributes to the factor as opposed to the total score. Okay. Um, all right, so validity. Um, validity, yeah, yeah, yeah. Reliability actually has to do with the accuracy of your measurement. So, for example, if you if you did test retest reliability, you want to see whether or not you you get the same results or something similar the second time around. So the uh, so the idea is that if you got totally different uh, results the second time around, it says your 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 instrument is not reliable. Validity is related, but it's totally different. But it's it's different. Um, um, it's related, but different. Okay. Um, basically, it, uh, validity has to do with the fact that you you know you, you can actually prove that you you are measuring what you say you are measuring. So you're actually measuring the construct that you say is what this instrument is for, and so um, and we'll get into how we actually do that. Um, but first of all, validity is not equivalent to reliability. So you can have reliability without validity. Um, yeah, so you can have reliability without validity. Let me make sure I said that right. So for example, shoe size can be very reliable, but it's not a great measure of intelligence. Okay. Um, so it's the idea that reliability does not automatically give you validity. But in order to have validity, you need to have reliability because you cannot 
correlate anything with, any, with a measure with anything else if it's not reliable. If the second time around you, you correlate a, an instrument with itself and you don't get the same results, it says it's not reliable. And so if it's not reliable with itself, it's not reliable with anything else. And so there's no way of determining, there's no way of having validity without reliability. Okay. So types of validity, um, these are things that are probably, um, everyone talks about, um, and I'll just go through them briefly because, you know, it's, it's good for you. It's like spinach. So anyway, um, face validity just means that you know, if you look at an item, it actually, the item actually looks like, you know, you're measuring, you know, it's, it's you know, it, it talks about what you're, you're, you're trying to measure. So it's, you know, it, it's, um, I think one, um, one instrument that probably is not too terribly uh, valid in terms of face validity is the Rorschach, where you have an ink blot. What does that have to do with per someone's personality? Okay, so, uh, you know, face validity uh, is useful basically if, first of all, if, you're, if a patient looks at a question or looks at an ink blot, you know, it takes a lot less explaining if the question looks like what you're talking about. You know, having to deal with you know a patient and having to explain what is you know what, what to do with a, an ink ink blot is a lot harder because it doesn't have face validity. Content validity refers to the extent to which um, the items measure all aspects of a construct. So, as we indicated before, caregiving has many different parts to it, many different factors. And so, what you want to do is you want to have questions that cover um, the construct in a nice, comprehensive way, or at least in an adequate way, um, so that um, it's what most people think about when they, 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 they consider that construct. And then finally, predictive validity means that you can predict how well someone will perform it at some later time. And so um, that you get into when you do um, achievement testing or aptitude testing, so like the SAT, you know, all, all the other scholastic tests allow you to uh, predict how well someone's going to do later on based on some score they take like six or, or six or 12 months before. This is totally tangential to what we're talking about, but I just thought I'd mention it. What we're really interested in, in is construct validity. And basically, construct validity means that, um, well, we have a construct like carege caregiver burden. It has different parts. And caregiver burden doesn't exist by itself. It exists in terms of a whole number of other factors. And so if a care caregiver feels burdened, they should feel possibly depressed or sad, they should have problems with their quality of life, they should possibly, they possibly have some problems with their, their health. So having a construct means that it's, it's going to be related to other constructs. And so what you should be able to do is show that you can relate caregiver burden to other constructs in some way. And so uh, convergent validity refers to um, the fact that based on what you know about caregiver burden or, or about the, the construct, it should have positive correlations with other constructs or other measures of those constructs. So you should have a positive, caregiver burden should also be positively related, positive in quotes, um, with um, sadness or emotional problems, health problems, that kind of thing. Um, so it's, you'd expect that there would be correlations in a positive direction. Divergent or discriminant validity means that um, things that are not related to um, um, the construct will, will not correlate highly. So these are, th um, so something like shoe size, for example, will, you know, should sh or, or, or things you wouldn't expect to correlate with your construct should show you know, low correlations, non-significant correlations. The problem with divergent or discriminant validity is that a lot of times things, constructs relate to, you know, a lot of things. And so it's often very difficult to show discriminate and, uh, validity simply because things are so interconnected with one another when you talk about psychological constructs. So it's more often you're going to see construct validity being shown. So let's take a look at different ways of showing con convergent validity. Um, one thing would be to um, show that your measure of, of the construct measures or correlates positively with other measures of the same construct. Or it's correlated with measures of related constructs. So constructs that are not caregiver burden but might be related to caregiver burden. Um, then you can do something like if you, if you have groups that are likely to show differences in terms of caregiver burden. So let's say 
caregivers who take care of more seriously ill patients, patients who have been ill longer, or patients with some sorts of disease that you would expect the, the caregiver to, to um, do, have to do more effort in terms of taking care of that patient. And then you might look at background characteristics. So it could be possible that certain relationships, um, um, certain types of caregivers, um, and we'll see uh, where that works, but basically you look at several different things that are likely to show differences as a function of differences in your construct. So for the Basque, we did conversion validity with um, um, going back to that list of, of other instruments with the burden assessment scale. And lo and behold, we got an, an, a positive correlation of 0.54, very, which, is, which is pretty high in this kind of work. Then other positive correlations were with um, unmet needs, financial burden, social burden. So basically, uh, the burden assessment scale was another measure of the same construct, so that's a very strong indicator that we're measuring so something that someone else says is a measure of that construct. And then other things, unmet needs, financial burden, all those things are related to caregiver burden, and those also show positive correlations. And notice that the strongest one is with the other measure of, construct, of the construct, and then the other ones kind of go down, so it's what you'd expect. Things that are not that are not the same thing but are related will show lower correlations. So it's a nice pattern. In terms of negative, um, negative correlations, and negative correlations are also ind indicative of conversion validity. So the more burden there is, the lower their quality of life. The lower, the, uh, the lower their mental health, the lower their satisfaction with the patient's care, which is kind of like, um, is useful for, uh, you know, just, just for, um, um, you know, relationships with the, the family, um, s social support, and, and also sleep disruption. Sleep disruption was kind of the curious thing because you'd expect that that would be um, positive. And we, we kind of um, looked at the item, and it was like the number of times a person had to get up at night to, take, to look at the, um, the, uh, the loved one. And we, we weren't quite sure how to interpret it. It could be that um, the, you know, the, the, the more you're concerned about the, the loved one, um, or, or actually, or it could be that the, the less your burden, the, 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 um, yeah, the less your burden, the more likely you are to, to look at the, uh, the, the, uh, at the loved one because um, you, you feel a little bit more relaxed, you're a little bit more concerned about the loved one. The reason why I'm having difficulties is it's like one of those those curious results, and it's like it's always one of those things that you have to to explain in the review. But it's like um, it, it's kind of an unreliable item, so it's like but it's like the fly in the ointment. It's like you know it's bothersome. But anyway, in terms of the pattern that we got for all the other items, all those do fit, and so um, we're, we're pretty happy with that. Um, we also did different group validity, so we looked at. Um, what happens when you take different types of caregivers? And what we found was that adult children taking care of parents were more burdened than parents taking care of children or spouses taking care of the, the other uh, spouse. And if you think about it, you know, um, the older children might have jobs, they have families, and so that's a burden on top of taking care of you know, other people that they have. Um, and then females were more burdened than males, which is kind of... Um, um, I mean, that, that seems to follow um, a lot of other uh, uh, results that people get. And then single caregivers were more burdened than married caregivers. So again, someone who's by himself or herself, they have to do more work. They have less, they're not able to share the responsibilities with a, with a, a partner. Um, other validity um, findings, we found that the, um, there were positive correlations with uh, health problems. So stomach and intestinal problems, sure sign of stress. Depression, hypertension. So, and then um, um, significant correlations with osteoporosis. The only thing we could say there is that um, it's possible that people with osteoporosis had more difficulty doing, carrying out tasks for the loved one. So, and there are no significant correlations with, with caregiver age or spiritual well-being. And we weren't expecting any, really. But, and so you could consider those as diversion validity or, you know, um, but basically, those are things that you would expect to be correlated, and if they were, well, 
that would be interesting, but um, again, it's difficult to, to establish diversion validity. Okay, and pretty much uh, that's it for the talk, except that where are we going now? Well, or what, what do you do in general when you have an instrument? Well, if you have an instrument, what you might want to see is whether or not um, we did something that technically is a no-no. We, we had um, one single group that we did the item an, uh, analysis on, and we also did the, our validity uh, study on. And technically, what you should do uh, is actually takes two separate groups. So you do one group where you do... You, you, you create your instrument, and then you take another group, another 100 people, and you test. It's nice to do that if you have the money, if someone's, but, you know, um, but what we're doing is actually we're, we're, um, we've used the Basque and other uh, populations, and um, right now we're in the process of validating a version in Chinese for Chinese speakers. And actually we had already translated into Spanish, but no one gave us money to validate it. We, we got money for the Chinese validation, so... Um, we're in the second year of doing that, and we should be ready to publish soon. It's actually a very nice study. What we're finding with the Chinese uh, population is that a lot of the same factors are coming up. We actually added items that were like specific to Chinese society, so problems, li linguistic problems, or just you know problems culturally dealing with uh, um, with uh, the medical structure, and so um, we're, we're kind of coming up with some interesting results. Uh, but in general, we're replicating whatever we had before. Ricardo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the validated actually is this whole process of like finding the reliability and then validating it, meaning that when you, you compare it to other um, measures and you find correlations that make sense, that's all part of the validation process. And it's kind of made up of, first of all, determining the reliability and then establishing the validity. So that's, that's all part of the validation process. Um, it's actually. So you know, you, use tool and you say it hasn't mm -hmm. been validated. Well, it means that first of all, someone can tell you that it has a known reliability. So someone can quote um, either a test, we test reliability coefficient or correlation or um, uh, uh, Cohen's alpha, and then also um, there are there's there's a literature that says it correlates with such and such measures that make sense in terms of establishing construct validity or some sort of validity. So that's what it means if an instrument is validated. So it's really both of those things. That someone's gone through and made, they haven't just made up the questions and you know, published it. They've also established the fact that you know, there's proof to indicate it's reliable and, va and valid. OK? Um, we've been established also using the instrument in new situations. So we've been, uh, one study was using the BAS to screen caregivers who were bringing in their, their, loved, their, their elderly loved ones. Um, and seeing whether or not the, the caregivers themselves might need to be referred to social workers or, or require some sort, of, um, um, some sort of help, either therapeutically or, or just in terms of um, um, logistics, in terms of caring for the caregiver. And then finally, we have a, a web-based version, um, if you want to ch check it out. Um, it's kind of very informal. Uh, we had to kind of keep it very low-key because we, we, we haven't really established norms for this, but we kind of came up with like very loose cutoffs. So like if a patient is above a certain level on a, a one of the factors, then we, we kind of suggest, why don't you go see someone because you, we think we need, you need help. So actually, you can check that out and, and let us know what you think about it. But anyway, I think that's it for my talk. And we did it on time. Are there any questions? You're all asleep? Yeah. The best way of doing it is with a different sample because then you can show that um, it's not some quirk of the sample that you had originally. I mean, so optimally, if you can, you know, establish your measure, you know, you, you, you create your items, you, you you have your instrument, then you go, you collect another sample and you you do your validation against it. And so, like, you measure again things that that um, you know this establish construct validity. That's usually the best way of doing it. But sometimes, if you don't have the money, you have to cut corners. But and if you're testing two different samples, and you're testing the reliability of the instrument, are you looking for, um, uh, you're testing two similar samples to 
You should. Or um, the second. So that, yeah. Then the, then the um, instrument should have, it should be able to predict the response of the second sample if. if no. Those are two, sim two different samples. So mm -hmm. if, if, if you want to have. If you want to determine test retest reliability, you really ha you have the, you need the same sample, and you need to bring them back at some reasonable span of time mm -hmm. to see whether or not they res they respond the same way. So that then, if you correlate the two times, then you get a high correlation. All right. Yeah. If you have two different samples, the only way of determining reliability would be to do uh, what the Cronbach's alpha within each sample. And so, if you found that in both samples you got a fairly respectable Cronbach's alpha, that would be, it's replicating it, but it's not, that's not test retest reliability. But you are establishing the fact that with another sample, it's, you know, you, 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 you get similar results, and so, like, you've replicated it, and so, like, it seems to be a, 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 a repeatable result. So it just establishes the, the reliability. Could you okay. see if there are questions at Podell or SLR by asking them? Yeah. Are there any questions out there in the, uh, the ether, like at Podell or uh, at uh, St. Luke's Roosevelt?